All right, so what I want to do today is I want to talk about canonical forms. And the whole idea of canonical forms is you want to put something in a standard input, in a standard way of presentation. There are advantages of this. Uh, I will risk asking this question. How many of you remember anything from Calc 3? No. <laughs> okay, who, 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 who's the honest person and said no? Can I get an m, &M for that? You may get an M&M &M for that. <laughs> Unfortunately, you then lose an M&M &M for not knowing Calc 3. <laughs> but you did, you, you did earn an M&M &M for your honesty, okay? One of the things that's sometimes done in Calc 3 is you talk about parametrizing curves. <laughs> And you talk about walking, you talk about calculating lengths. Did any of you calculate lengths of curves in Calc 3? All right, I see a few heads going yes. When you calculate lengths, it's really nice to assume you do something called parametrized by uh, unit speed. Why do you want to do that? So you have a standard for, for, to, to the speed you can still do it anyway. What's the advantage of traveling around a curve in unit speed? You don't have to remember, damn it, do I divide by the length or the norm of the speed or not? You know, there's this extra factor, where do I put it in? If you standardize things in certain ways, you don't have to worry about a lot of those issues. I'm going to first talk about solving quadratic equations and then go from that to putting linear programming problems into canonical form. To kind of motivate, I will do the $125 million NASA whoopsie. Anybody know this? What word? Give me one word to describe it. Imperial units? Well, I guess that's the units. <laughs> and as Scotland has voted to stay as part of the UK, we will keep things together and we will hyphenate. So I'll count that as one word in honor of the Scottish referendum. Imperial units. Okay? This was a $125 million whoopsie for NASA. They had a probe that was going to look at things in Mars, and everything was measuring in the metric system and assuming things were in the metric system, except for one subcomponent, which was using the English system. And so when it passed on the information to the thrusters, the thrusters just assumed the measurements were in the metric system and miscalculated exactly how much thrust was needed at some point, and you got $125 million just going up in smokes. The advantage of this is that this is now a great story for all of us professors to tell our students throughout the rest of time about the importance of units and the importance of standardizing things. They had one thing working in a different measurement than everything else, and that caused a huge problem. I'm going to post a link to this in the additional comments. There's a lot of really nice discussions about how they should have realized something was going on before they actually got to Mars. They're making too many small course corrections. They should have realized there was an issue, did not, $125 million up in smoke. Okay. Let's talk about canonical forms. Is it easy or hard to solve this? Easy. Solution. So x is negative b over a. I could have had ax equals negative b. There's lots of different ways of writing it. I could put all of my linear equations like this. Let's now go to the quadratic. What is the simplest quadratic to look at? ax squared. All right. That might be even too simple for me. ax squared plus b. I'm going to write ax squared plus c equals 0 because I've given this lecture before and I know how I want to do my notation. Is this easy to solve? Yeah, it's essentially the same as this. In fact, I could replace this 2 with a 3, 4, or 5, no problem at all. I know how to solve this. And I get from this that x squared is negative c over a. I'm just treating x squared as my variable. I know how to solve for something like that. And now I now have to solve this very special cube, very, very special quadratic. And now I get x equals plus or minus the square root of negative c over a. All right. Let's consider a more interesting quadratic. Let's consider now ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0. 
how should I solve this? <coughs> I'm sorry? Okay, unfortunately we don't know the quadratic formula. We're going to have to re-derive it. That's what we're going to prove right now. So I'm going to try to show you why people prove the quadratic formula the way they do. Yes? Um, complete, the complete the square. What does completing the square do? It turns it into 2. So complete the square become 2. And so we want a x squared plus b plus c equals 0. I'm sorry, plus bx. So if I look at this, this is a x squared plus bx. I'm sorry, this should be b over a. Uh, b over a plus b over ax plus b squared over 4a squared. Because when I cross terms, let's see, do I want 4a squared? Minus b squared over 4a squared plus c equals 0. So I'll have then a b over 2a. And then when I expand everything out, it's going to be perfect. So now if you look at what we get, we get a x plus b over 2a squared minus b squared over 4a plus c equals 0. Do we know how to solve something like this? Yeah, we're really solving something of this form. If you want, we could do something a little bit more general. We could do maybe case 2 prime, a x plus h squared plus c equals 0. That will have solutions x equals negative h plus or minus the square root of negative c over a. If I just tweak that a little bit, it's no difficult. It's no more harder to solve. And so over here now, we can just continue to do the algebra. Uh, if I do the algebra, what will I get? I have a b over 2a, I have a negative b squared over 4a, I bring this over, I'll get negative <coughs> c plus b, da, 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 I get c, so I get b squared minus 4ac all over 4a. When I bring this over, I have to divide by the a over here, I get an a squared, I take a square root, I'll get negative b over 2a plus or minus that. And there's the quadratic formula. Now that we've had this wonderful success with linear and we've had this wonderful success with quadratics, what comes next? Cubic. cubic. And after cubic. On to the quartic and after quartic. No, actually that's it. So there's success for the cubic, there's success for the quartic, but there's a deep theorem that you cannot write down the solution to a general quintic or higher as a function of the coefficients. And just elementary operations, plus times, minus divide, radicals, we can't do that. Now the cubic, how do we do the cubic? The idea is maybe start with certain cubics that are easier to study than others and somehow go from the more general cubic to the cubics you can understand. This is not a class in solving polynomial equations. I will stop here at the quadratic. I encourage you to read about solving the cubic and the quartic and the challenges there and trying to reduce to simpler cases. That's a great theme for what we're going to be doing today. We're going to try to take a general linear programming problem and put it into a canonical form. What this means is we will only need to write one type of program, one type of software package, because we will always put things in in the same input. Now, from a practical point of view, do you think you always want to convert everything to the same format? No. Right? It's often very convenient, depending on local situations, to write things in different ways. From a theoretical point of view, it's very convenient to have a standard form, and I can always assume my thing looks like this. And I don't have to worry about all these different cases. If this is positive, I do this. If this is negative, I do this. I've just put everything into a canonical form. So now we're going to look at this from linear programming. So we have ax 
relationship B, and the relationship will be some less than, some equals, and some greater than. We'll have constraints on the xi's, say maybe xi is greater than or equal to mi, and we want to maximize or minimize a linear function C transpose x, which is C1 x1 plus, I don't know, Cn xn. So this is the general framework for linear programming problem. I have some relationships with less than, equal, or greater than here. I have some constraints on my x's. And I have something that I want to maximize or minimize. So I have three different things that I get to play with and choose. So three different choices. I'm going to try to make them all canonical. Do I need to allow both less than and greater than in this relationship? OK, why not? OK. Well, no, I'm saying right now I'm looking at AX relative to B. So I have all these different rows. So here's my matrix A. Here's X. And here's B. And maybe the first row is greater than, then equal to, then greater than, then less than, then less than, then equal to, then greater than. You know, I'm going to get all these different inequalities. Do I need to worry about both greater thans and less thans? Or can I do something to my matrix A or to my, matrix, or my vector B? What? I can always negate a row of A so that if I ever have a greater than, I, I can replace it with a less than. Or if you don't like less thans, if I have a less than, I can replace it with a greater than. So uh, by negating a row may assume we never have what? Do you want to kill less thans or do you want to kill greater thans? This is your choice. OK. We will never have a less than. OK? The reason I don't really care is because I'm not going to kill the greater thans. OK? So we've just killed less thans. Killing greater thans is a bit more work. And here, it may not be a good thing to do. So just because we can create this canonical form does not necessarily mean this is the best form to do. So now, Killing greater than in A, X, relation B. So imagine we have A, I1, X1, plus dot, 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 plus A, I, N, X, N is greater than B. What we're going to do is we're going to introduce a new variable. So introduce negative zi. And we're going to have a constraint that zi is let's see, greater than or equal to 0. OK? So let's think about what happens. And we'll see if I did things right. So we have ai1, x1, plus a i n x n minus z i. And I want to see now that this equals b. Um, so actually, do I want to go this way or do I want to go the other way? Um, So let's see. So you, you'll tell me if I want to have a minus sign or a plus sign. Rather than me thinking about it, you think. Do I want to have a minus sign or a plus sign? A plus. Why plus? I think you're absolutely right that it is a plus. What happens if z equals 0? If z equals 0, then I have the relationship that I want equals b. What if z gets large now? What if z is now 5? Does this sum have to still be greater than or equal to b? Or could it be now less than b? 
Oh, okay, so maybe the plus sign is wrong. Let's try the minus sign. If I put the minus sign, if zi equals 0, I have my relationship equals b, that's good. Now imagine I increase zi. zi is now 5. If zi is 5, what must be true about this now? I'm sorry? So if this is 5, what must this whole thing sum to? b plus 5. And it is greater than b. So if zi is, I, I change the, the plus back to minus. So if zi is 5, I'm subtracting 5. So the only way that this can equal b is if this equals b plus 5. Yes? Right, so if I put in a negative zi and I force zi to be greater than or equal to 0, I think I'm okay. Oh, oh, I, I see. You, okay, yes. So I, I, I'll do greater than or equal to 0. Thank you. And so what I've done is I've added an extra variable. And in some sense, look at it this way. Let's say this is greater than b. Let's say it's b plus 3. Well, I'll just introduce a new variable, zi, and I'll let zi be 3, and I'll subtract that. And now I have an equality. So the whole point here is I always want to replace greater than or equal to's with equal to's. <coughs> and I can do this by introducing a new variable. So this new variable picks up the slack. And now I can write down my equations without having any of these inequalities. Think back to the diet problem which we did on Wednesday. And so, you know, again, I apologize for the one minute spiel and what we did yesterday did not include the diet problem. In the diet problem, we looked at these feasibility regions. We're going to lose some of that because we're not going to have these inequalities now. We're going to have equalities everywhere. <coughs> you want to have exactly a certain amount of nutrition. So when you're doing something like the diet problem, you may not want to put it in canonical form. But it is possible to do so. Any questions on how we can get rid of all the greater thans and less thans and now assume that everything is an equal? Question? I'm sorry? Yeah, we did that yesterday. Wednesday. Yesterday, yesterday always means previous class, tomorrow always means next class. <laughs> it's uh, standard mathematical notation. Actually, more like academic notation, I think. Now, what, yes? Um, all right, so, so one possibility is to put a strictly greater than. Um, so the thing is, if, if we want something to be strictly greater, we would have to allow ourselves to have our variables strictly greater. And then the problem with that is we actually do not want to do that. And the reason we don't want to do that is we no longer have a compact set. We no longer have a closed set. So if you allow yourself a strict, then you're in trouble because you have no minimum value for some things. We want to have a bounded, compact set. And so that's a, that's a really good point. We want to make sure we have uh, strictly greater than equal to's. Now let's think about what is the damage that was done here. We added this new variable zi. So we could potentially add one new variable for each row of a. If we have a lot of constraints, we've added a lot of variables. Have we changed the objective function? No. So the objective function doesn't really matter that we put in these z's here. It's just allowing us to now put it in a more canonical form. All right, so is everybody happy with the first part that in the relations we may now assume that it's always an equal sign? Uh, we now have the constraints on the xi's and then maximize or minimize. So I guess let's just keep going in order. Let's deal with the constraints on the xi's. So in many real world problems, there are two types of constraints. Either x has to be greater than a certain amount or less than a certain amount, or it has to be integer valued. 
So we talked about examples where things have to be integer valued. You cannot fly half a plane from Albany to Salt Lake City. You typically cannot buy half a set of hot dog rolls. Okay? I will try to find the Steve Martin clip. I, can you buy half a pound of some commodity? In a lot of things, yes. And so you're buying you know, half a gallon of oil, half a gallon of gas, half a gallon of milk. Okay. These things are fine to do. Okay. The more serious one is what about these lower bounds and upper bounds? Can you see situations where you cannot buy or sell, I'm sorry, where you cannot uh, have something above a certain threshold? So where would be a situation where you can't have xi greater than a certain value? If it exceeds the supply. If it exceeds the supply. Uh, when I was in grad school, Tickle Me Elmo came out and was really, really popular. And there was a huge rush on the stores to get Tickle Me Elmo. And I remember you know, reading stories about you know, the son of a mob boss you know, somehow walking out of a Toys of Us with 200 Tickle Me Elmos. Somehow. somehow. <laughs> hey, considering all the things they could be putting on the streets, Tickle Me Elmo in the greatest scheme of things isn't so bad. But uh, you can't buy more Tickle Me Elmos than is in the store. Right? Also, sometimes you have a minimum purchase. You know, we, have a, we have a promotion going on. Buy three, get the fourth free. So if you want the deal, you've got to buy at least three. Or we might be distributing things and we might have a notion of fairness. I have a bunch of cookies. I've got to make sure everybody gets at least one cookie. Uh, for those of you who did any science research over the summer here, we have pizza every Tuesdays. And the rule is you cannot take more than two slices the first time through the line because you want to make sure everybody gets a chance to have pizza before you go back for seconds. So how do we deal with constraints on the x's? So there are constraints on xi. So let's assume we have xi is greater than or equal to mi. There are three possibilities. Case one, mi is greater than or equal to is greater than or equal to zero. Then what we can do is we can add the condition xi is greater than or equal to mi and xi is greater than or equal to 0. I'm trying to get things into canonical form. My canonical form is that I may assume all the x's are non-negative. So I've added a new condition. Do I want to add conditions with a greater than or equal to? No. Is it that painful that I've added a greater than or equal to? What can I do? Same trick. I can remove it. So just in ease of exposition, I'm going to just write this condition down by having a greater than or equal to. It's really not a big deal. I can remove that. So I can always rewrite the constraint that xi is greater than or equal to m as a constraint on the x's. I can move that condition into the A matrix. I'll add a new row to the A matrix. And I'll now assume that xi is greater than or equal to 0. I'd, what's case 2? OK. We'll do mi is less than 0 and finite. I, so now I want to figure out how can I deal with something like this. So I can change variables. I want to relate yi to xi. How should I have them related? So I wonder, yes. So yi equals what? Um, OK, one thing I, I could do is I could make yi negative xi, and then this reduces to case 1. Excellent. So make sure you email me about that. So that's, that's one way to try to go about this. But I want to come up with a relationship, a kind of xi, and then what do I want to put to the right of xi? It's got to be something involving mi. And 
And I want, at the end of the day, I want yi to be greater than or equal to 0. So what relationship should I have here? What sign should I put in? We've got two choices. Minus. minus. Let's try the minus. So if I start xi off at mi, I get y equals 0. If I increase xi above mi, then this has become positive. So xi being greater than or equal to mi is the same as yi is greater than or equal to 0. And in fact, if yi is greater than or equal to 0, that becomes the same as this. So I can replace every occurrence of xi. I now just get xi is just yi plus mi. And I now have yi is greater than or equal to 0. Why do I have to assume that mi is finite? Yeah, if it's infinite, I can't really do this. So we have to deal with that case separately. So case three, mi equals minus infinity. So now we have the condition that xi is greater than or equal to minus infinity. xi is just real. We want to write xi as greater than or equal to 0. Or we want to replace it with a variable that's greater than or equal to 0. But we have that it's just greater than or equal to minus infinity, the completely unrestricted case. The solution is beautiful. We write xi as ui minus vi, where ui and vi are greater than or equal to 0. So you give me any value of xi. Can I write xi as ui minus vi? Yeah. Now, this is a little bit wasteful. I've now introduced two variables. And so again, in terms of runtime, in terms of efficiency, some of these decisions may be bad decisions. I've put it in a canonical form, yes, but at great cost. Okay. Any questions on dealing with the constraints? Yes. Is there, uh, I, I guess I'm just wondering for case three. Right. That I understand that, you know, this is, okay, this is a way of technically writing it. Right. But it seems, I mean, I, it just seems to be rather pointless, because I mean, it's not like we have any constraint. I mean, UI and VI have. have well, but it, I, I'm trying to constrain where my region lives. And so now, all of my variables are greater than or equal to 0. Okay. That gives me some control over the space I'm looking at. Yes? Uh, could you give an example of what situation where we would be in case 3? Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, what's a good physical quantity temperature? Are you saying that the x, i, all like sense to negative infinity, or they're greater than negative so I choose a number on the real line. Okay, if I choose a number and you know, I'm trying to figure out you know, something from that number, well, I could go all the way off to negative infinity. I can choose a number anywhere. You know, maybe I'm looking at some model of the universe which is unbounded. And so right now, I'm, I'm sorry? Our debt ceiling limit. Our debt ceiling limit, um, yes. Our debt ceiling limit is unbounded through finitely bounded stages. Well, theoretically, if you're trying to choose, say, an optimum for an abstract limit, like how much debt should we allow, and you're trying to do the calculation based on that, technically there is no lower bound. You, you might have then, but you might then have there's only so much money in the universe as, you know, do you have something like that? So, I mean, if you consider the universe is infinite, then you could have your starting position could be anywhere on a real line or anywhere in three-dimensional space. And then you would want to be completely unrestricted. And so there's a lot of physical systems where we would like to be able to do something like that. There's a nice part in the book where it talks about a quadratic programming problem to try to find you know, how many stars there are in different regions of the space. And you know, again, for a lot of things, you're never going to really have an infinity because it's really just a huge finite box. But for practical purposes, it's often convenient to just assume things are infinite. Uh, when we have Parents Weekend, I might give my baseball lecture. 
And in my baseball lecture, I talk about how you model runs scored and runs allowed and use this to predict the probability a team will win a baseball game. If you're a Red Sox fan, as I am this year, it's actually not that difficult to predict the probability Red Sox will win a game this year. It's but in general, you know, with given information, how well can you predict a team's winning percentage? It turns out to be very convenient to assume teams can score infinitely many runs in a game. Now, that's not going to happen, and the probability of scoring infinitely many runs is so low as to be negligible. But just mathematically, it's convenient to allow yourself to have that infinite, because otherwise you have to truncate things. So sometimes it is useful to have that complete freedom and not have to deal with these restrictions as to, I can only go in a certain way. Any other questions on constraints? But you know, in the real physical problems we're going to deal with, case 3 doesn't really arise that much. All right, the last one is the easiest one. Is the theory is only going to allow us to do maximization or minimization. And I believe our book chooses minimization. So only need to do minimization. Okay. If you want to maximize C transpose X, it's the same as minimizing negative C transpose times X. So this is the easiest one of the three. We're not adding any new variables. We're not adding any new conditions. We're just saying, look, just multiply C by negative 1. And at this point, we now have reduced it to something we already know. OK. So the whole point of this is, given any linear programming problem, we can now put into canonical form. And henceforth, in the book, when it's doing all the analysis, it's going to assume we have things in canonical form. So in particular, when we prove the simplex method works, we will assume our linear programming problem is in canonical form. When we get to the duality principle, we will assume we're in canonical form. It may not be the best move to do this. Okay? And so again, when we, we've talked about efficiency up the wazoo in this class. We may have made mistakes in doing this. This may have been costly. It may be better to write certain algorithms that take into account the fact that you have a given structure. So here's one of my favorite problems. Um, and the answer is 24,600. 24, How did you do this? So everything cancels like this. This is called a, there's a famous name for this kind of sum, telescoping. So the reason it's called telescoping, you know, if, you, if you ever had one of these old pirate telescopes, you know, you collapse it like that. It collapses down to just 24601 minus 1. If I wanted to write a procedure to evaluate general sums, how would I evaluate general sums? I'd probably sum the first row, sum the second row, sum the third row, sum the fourth row, and then add them up. In general, is it better to add things like this? Does it really save you much in general? No. This is the case of incredible cancellation. Most of the times when you have addition problems, you're not going to have cancellation like this. But there may be times when you do, and you can exploit that additional structure. So you might have the ability of having certain algorithms that will run better depending on how things look. There's a whole class of algorithms that deal with matrices that are called sparse. These are matrices where most elements are zero. And if you have a sparse matrix, you can do a lot with it. Most of the entries in the matrix are zero. You want to be very careful about how you store things, how you work with things. OK. So we've now got canonical form. I thought it would be fun to end the week with you know, trying to do a linear programming problem. So I think one of the standard ones is the oil one. So you have 
big R refineries, one, two, all the way up to R, you have big C cities, oh, that's, um, we'll call it big M markets, one, two, what do you think my problem is? What, what do you think I'm trying to do? Okay, say it again. Get oil. Okay, be more specific. Most profitably, right? So if I want to get oil to the markets cheaply, I need to know certain pieces of information. What information do I need to attack this problem? Yes. Okay, so one thing is I might need to know some things about transportation issues. What else? Prices and costs. Prices and costs. What, what, what prices and costs? You know, like, at market M, what's the price going to be? Ah, so see, th this shows you how complicated the problem can be. What if different markets have different costs? So let's say, for instance, um, you know, people in New York are paying $4 a gallon, and people in Baltimore are paying $3 a gallon. What do you want to do? Depends where your refineries are. If your refineries happen to be such that the cost of going to Baltimore and the cost of going to New York is about the same, what would you want to do? <coughs> Go to New York. It also depends on how much oil you'd expect to sell. So you also need to know how much of the supply. Okay, so are you a big enough player that you can actually affect the demand? Hope, we're actually in a nice world where it's a dictatorship. And so, anybody know the Octan Corporation? All right, we're the Octan Corporation. And we have complete monopoly over everything. Yes? Arctan. Not Octan. <laughs> Octan. Anybody know Octan? That one person. Yeah, it's from Lego. All right, cultural reference, right? It's Lord Business's company. All right, we're the Octan, and they, they have their oil trucks and everything, all right? What else do we need? Yes? Uh, how much each refinery can produce. How much each refinery can produce. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into just solving a problem like this. So let's start listing things. So PM is price sells at market M, DM is demand at market M, uh, SR is the supply from refinery R, CRM is the cost to ship one unit from R to M. Anything else we need? There's so many other things we can put in, yes. So one possibility is, you know, are we constrained in the number of ships we have and where they are? So for now, we will assume we have arbitrary many ships at our disposal. Yes? So absolutely. And this is one reason why, rather than risking your oil refinery being nationalized, you instead take over the government. It's just good business. <coughs> and so you do have, in many places, the very credible threat of your assets being confiscated. And when you're trying to calculate, you know, do you want to make an investment? How much money do you want to put there? Well, the dictator assures you that there's no danger of being confiscated. Yes? I'm assuming this is, this is not under um, this 
sort of a fun, but just the thought of either expanding to additional markets or building other refineries, closing down some refineries. So, so this would be a new thing as to what if you want to put in new refineries, new, what if you want to hit new markets? What if new markets are going to open up? And so, for instance, um, I was on, I didn't put this in the solution to the homework, but in one of the homework problems, no, maybe I did. One of the homework problems, I talk about using Taylor series to approximate the sine function from the table of you know, sine values and interpolating. When you create your t lookup tables, for the most part, you have your points equally spaced. And if you have 20 points, put them all equally spaced. That's actually a very poor thing to do. The reason is you want to put your points to the places where, if the function is varying greatly, you want more points there. If the derivative is very small, you want fewer points. You want more points where the function has wild behavior. What if you have the option of getting to add more points at a later date? Where do you want to put your points now? What if you're not assured that you'll be able to add more points at a later date, but you might be able to? How do you want to maximize your gain? And so over here, there could be markets opening up, but there may not be. Right now, we're assuming just one snapshot in time, you know, one moment. But really, you're going to be playing this problem time after time after time. There's, so uh, Walmart, one of the reasons Walmart is now talked about and not Kmart is because Walmart was very good at problems like this in terms of getting stuff from their stores uh, from their, I'm sorry, from their warehouses to their stores. And we will talk about the mathematics behind Walmart in detail later this semester. Right now, um, there's uh, some issues here. And in a pure math class, it's fine. So we have dm is the demand at market m. How do we know the demand? Yes? So one thing is we take them as given and we say, oh, this is the demand. Do you think we can accurately estimate the demand? Yes? Yeah, I mean, the more data we have over time, the better estimates we should be able to get for something like demand. Um, I've done work for the movie industry, and one of the big things you want to do is you want to predict how many people will see a new movie. So you have a bunch of parameters for each movie. What kind of parameters might indicate whether or not the movie is successful? Cost. I'm sorry? Cost of the movie. Maybe a big movie with a large special effects budget people might want to see. What else? Yes? The range of the target audience. The, for families and that's right. You know, if you're aiming for, oh, I don't know, Jewish World War II veterans who are Red Sox fans, <laughs> and you're going for that real niche market, probably not going to be a big blockbuster. What else? <laughs> when is the movie released? Is it released around Labor Day, Memorial Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas? There are certain times where really likely people will go to a movie. Arbor Day is not a good day to release a movie. Uh, genre. Genre. You know, you know, French films versus you know, action flicks. Well, depending on what country you're in, it may be a little bit different. But in America, I think more people will go to see the action flick. What else? Yes? I mean, I don't know how you quantify the names, the names of people. Yeah, the stars. You know, is there a big star? Some people just really like, uh, certain people like. I think Nicolas Cage. I'm sorry, Nicolas Cage. <laughs> <laughs> wow, do you guys know who Nicolas Cage is? Yeah. Yeah. All right, is this something like, the, okay. So people will go and see Nicolas Cage. <laughs> okay? Probably not the one I would have chosen, but he's, he's had some very good movies. Uh, what is your favorite Nicolas Cage? Probably Wicker Man. Okay. <laughs> I might have to go with, um, oh, now I'm blanking, it's with Sean Connery, the Alcatraz movie. Ghost Rider, Spirit of Vengeance? No, 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 no. What, what's the one with? Uh, the Rock. The Rock, The Rock, The Rock. Um, the, the National Treasure is a fun movie as well. So, you know, Nicolas Cage, especially in this class now, is going to be extremely popular. <laughs> and people will just have to see the latest Nicolas Cage movie. Okay? Uh, soundtrack. If there's a song from the movie that's really popular, Frozen. yeah, people might not be able to let it go from their minds and might have to go and see the movie, right? Might have to see the movie multiple times. 
right? So that the kids can learn the songs. <laughs> There's something else that you're not mentioning that's extremely important. Well, that's pretty uniform, yes. So one is the advertising budget, absolutely important. You know, are you basically hitting everything? Yes. Maybe how like, the overall economy is doing? How the overall economy is doing? What else is being shown? Excellent. What else is being shown? Let's say you've just released an action movie and it is the only action movie on the market. That's very different than if there are three other superhero movies going on at the same time. And so when you're trying to see how much you're going to get, there can be competition between movies for themselves, you know, for the same share. So over here, when we write down DM is the demand, as a mathematician, it's not that hard for me to just write, you know, DM, demand at market, you know, very easy for me to write down. But in terms of knowing this, very hard. To write this down as a number and not as a random variable, really, this should be varying. And I might want to have a whole series of solutions depending on what the demand is. I'll have different things. Do you think that there could be differences in demand based on what other markets are doing? Yes. Yeah. If one place has a huge demand for oil, they could be skyrocketing up the price. And if the price goes up, then the demand in somebody else might go down. So when you have problems like this, uh, there's the model, how many of you have heard of this model? The KISS model of mathematics? To keep it simple, stupid, start off with something very simple and slowly complicated. So what should we assume about all the prices? They're independent. They're independent, right? All the prices are the same, so that doesn't matter. What should we assume about the costs? Should we make all those the same? Or is that too much of a restriction? Maybe it's the same rate you know, per mile. Although actually it's not going to make any difference. All that I care about is how much it costs to ship from refinery R to market M. I don't care if it's by boat, by car, whatever. I just care about the cost. So it's OK for these to be varying. The supply, I can have different amounts. The demand, I can have different amounts. But I will assume that there's no dependencies between them. And so now what we want to do is we, start, we want to start writing down equations. So what will my variables be? So x r m is the amount r ships to m. And so now I want to figure out what should my constraints be. And so based on the time of day, we'll probably only do one or two constraints. Can somebody give me one constraint? Yes. OK. X R M is greater than or equal to zero. So you do not have New York City all of a sudden returning large amounts of oil to a refinery and saying no thank you. It's just not the New York City way. Okay, what else do we have? Capacity of the ports. I'm sorry? Okay, good. So how would I write that down? Well, I'm going to assume I can move the oil infinitely fast. Yeah. So it's bounded by the supply. And in fact, you can do a little bit better. The sum of XRM has to be less than or equal to SR. What do I want to sum over? M. So what this means is I cannot ship more oil than I have. Ship more oil than have. Yes? Do we care if all the markets get oil? Yes. So this then becomes very interesting. Uh, depending on your cost, you might be willing to screw certain markets, especially if you don't have enough oil for everyone. But for now, we will assume everybody has to get all their oil. So what constraint would that be? So the sum of XRM has to be greater than or equal to the demand. 
And what are we going to sum over? We're going to sum over r. And in fact, we can do a little bit better. Do I want to have greater than or equal to? No. I'm not going to give them more oil than they want. So you must beat demand. All right, so this is a good place to stop. But what I'm hoping you can see right now is with what we've done, we already know enough to start setting up real important problems. We don't have the techniques yet to solve them, but we can at least set them up and we have some idea of what are the issues that are going to rise to make this reasonable. This is not reasonable yet, but this is the start. This is the simple part of the kiss.